I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. He turned and then I saw the nail-scarred hands that bled for me. I touched the hill of his garment that fell round him there. My life, my heart I gave, my soul was in his care. When I awoke, my heart beat so the hem of his garment that fell round him there. My life, my heart I gave, my soul was in his care. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. He turned and then I saw the nail-scarred hands that bled. The hem of his garment that fell round him there. My life, my heart, I gave, my soul was in his Amen. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. Wonderful songs. And I'm glad he drew me to him. He said if he'd be lifted up, he'd draw all men or all kinds of people. And he drew me. And he drew you. You might be here this morning. And I hope he's trying to draw you or inviting you into the kingdom. Why are you living in spiritual darkness? Good question. Why are you? Multitudes of people are living in spiritual darkness today in our world. Dr. Vance Havner, an old mountain preacher, grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. I heard him preach probably around, when I was in Spruce Pine, around 83, 84 came to Spruce Pine, had a camp meeting there, and he preached there. He preached all over the world in America. Didn't even have a secretary. Unbelievable man. Uh, he was born in 1901 and died in 1986. So I heard him maybe a couple of years before he died. But uh, he preached a sermon, and it's titled, Getting Used to the Dark. I never heard that sermon, but I've read excerpts from it. Never heard it. But he said he was sitting in a restaurant eating lunch or dinner with some friend of his and said, the restaurant was so dark. He said, I needed a flashlight to read the menu. It was that dark. He said, I ate my food by faith, not by sight. And... He's from that restaurant 
came the sermon, Getting Used to the Dark. And a lot of times, if you'll notice, when you sit in the dark, after a while, you kind of get used to it and you can see a little more, right? You know, when you first get in a dark room, it's very hard. But the longer you're there, you, you can see. I think that's where America's at now. We're getting used to the dark. It's kind of, we're already used to it. So I'm not going to talk about his sermon. So I derailed off the sermon as I was walking, talking to God and meditating. And even though I thought a lot about his sermon, then God gave me this thought. This is the very thought he gave me. Let me get this thing to work in here. How? I want to ask the question, how we have gotten used to the dark? Or make a statement. How we have got used to the dark? And uh, I'm going to use a passage of Scripture that I've used many times before, but never from this perspective. I, I've never preached this sermon before. I've used the Scripture, but never preached it before like this, that God gave it to me. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. Uh, I call first to your attention, got it right there at a point, the silence of the gospel. Look at verse number three. Why don't you look at that verse? Paul says to the Corinthian Christians, Corinthian church, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I ask the question, how can the gospel be hid? But if the, our gospel, the gospel of the Christians, so it can be hid. And if we hide it, we're hiding it from who? Lost people. So there is the silence of the gospel today. And I'm not going to pre pick on a lot of these preachers but there is a great deal of social gospel today. Social preaching. I, I can kick on television and watch it. And I'm a, I'm a critic of Joel Osteen. He's a motivational speaker. I, I mean, I'd like, I'm not saying he's not saved. I'm not saying he don't love God and he don't love the Word of God. But he don't preach it like I think it ought to be preached to 17,000 people. Amen. Now, so I call it a social gospel. And it's kind of make you feel good gospel. Uh, Benny Hinn is another one. Watched him a lot. I, I watch these guys. It's not like I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a social gospel. Uh, Kenneth Copeland's another one. These guys are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they preach a social gospel. Kenneth Hagin is another one. These are all one that I think that they are really hiding the gospel in a sense of saying, you must be born again. There is a hell. Amen. And you are going to die. Amen. I mean, I've seen them interview, uh, people interview them and ask them a question. Do you believe Jews go to heaven? Do you believe homosexuals go to heaven? And by the way, there's no such thing as a homosexual. No. Because when you say that and I say that, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying that that is a person, if you're homosexual, you are what God made you to be. A woman and two women can commit a homosexual act that don't make them homosexuals. They're sinners. Two men can commit a homosexual act. It don't make them homosexuals. It makes them homosexual act. Sin, just like adultery, lying, cheating, murder, all of these. So they don't, they're no different than anybody else. They're sinners. Amen. That's what it is. See, we, see, what we've done, we've got used to the dark and we give labels and say they're a minority of people. They're sinners. And they need to be saved. 
They need to be born again. Amen. And we need to tell them that. Don't hide the gospel preachers. These preachers are hiding the gospel. I will never hide the gospel. I want to manifest, manifest the gospel in my preaching. I believe it. And I don't want no one to walk up to me and say, you never told me the truth. I want to tell people the truth. You're hiding the gospel. Did you know that you as a lay person can hide the gospel? By not sharing the gospel, not sharing your testimony, not sharing the truth to your people? Do you know we preachers can hide the gospel? I haven't talked about us. We can hide the gospel. We need to reveal the gospel. God Almighty lives inside of us. And the only way that, that the world can see God is through me and through you. Don't hide the gospel to the lost. And that's what Paul's saying. We're getting used to the dark. We're getting used to the dark because of the silence of the gospel today. Another reason is the sinner's blindness. Look at verse number four. The sinner's blindness. In whom the God. By the way, I've, I've elaborated on this many times, and you know it by heart. But those of you maybe who don't, then we're going to do exposition on tell you. The God of this world is the devil. That's who the God of the world is. That's the devil. So the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. So the God of the world is Satan, and what he has done, just like we, many preachers are hiding the gospel from the lost world, then Satan is blinding the minds of those who believe not. The lost people's minds are blinded. They just can't see. So he's done a masterful job of that. He's good at it. And so mind here is our thinking, our perception, our insight. That's what he, that's what he blinds. Our intellect, our ability to think, our awareness does a good job of it. Does a great job of it. He's blinded our minds less for fear. And, and he fears the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And that's what the gospel is. It's about Christ. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's all about Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Amen. It's the gospel. Breaks my heart when I see preachers get up and just fiddle around and won't preach the gospel. And I've been to a lot of conferences all over different states and Southern Baptist Convention and all that. And we got a lot of good preachers. I, mean, I miss W.A. Criswell. I'll tell you what a great preacher he was for the Baptist Church of Dallas. Heard him preach many times. Adrian Rogers, Jerry Falwell, D. James Kennedy. I could go on and on and on. These preachers are off the stage now. They're gone to be with God. And we've got preachers that's got a good stage and got a good platform to preach from and they're up there giving a social gospel when they need and they're hiding the gospel when they need to share the infallible inerrant word of God. Amen. That's what they're doing today. Don't they, won't they give count to God for that to hide the gospel? We're getting used to the dark. I, I've got some I, I was Looking at this verse and walking in Matthew 27, 45, 46. This is interesting. I never had seen this before. Now from the sixth hour, I'm talking about darkness. You know, darkness is evil. Darkness is sin. Uh, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until, until the ninth hour. So that would be 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. How many hours is that? Three. Three. Three hours of darkness. Why is it dark? Jesus is on the cross. Why is it dark? Twelve o'clock? It's three o'clock, right? He's on the cross for three hours and it's three o'clock. Interesting. Interesting. I said, I never have really seen that before, Lord. So, about the ninth hour, three o'clock, here's what he said. So he's been on the cross for three hours, 
Darkness from 12 up to 3. And now at the ninth hour, 3 o'clock, listen to what he says. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama, sakbak tani I don't know whether it's Arabic or probably maybe Hebrew or Greek language, but I know what it means because we have it meaning right here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's gone. God's nowhere around, right? Darkness, evil is now in control. The darkness represents evil. The demons of hell have got him on the cross. He's on the cross. He's agonizing. He's crying out to God. Deepness prevails now. Deepness is in charge right now. Three hours of darkness, three o'clock in the afternoon. And then in John 19 and 30, Jesus uttered these words. It is finished. Three hours of darkness. Three hours of satanic power and the demons of hell and Satan said, we've got him, it's over with, he's done for. Oh no, he said it's finished. He wasn't finished. Plan of salvation was finished. He had, he had accomplished what God wanted him to accomplish. God's gone. Let me say something about that. And people, some people don't even believe there's a hell. There is a hell. And let me tell you, and I think not only is the fire so excruciating that the rich man in Matthew chapter 16 cried for one drop of water to cool his tongue. And he said, it's, I'm tormented in this flame. But let me tell you what the, why, why did Jesus cry out like this? Why did he cry out like that? Because he sensed that God was nowhere around. I think one of the worst things in hell is to be where God is not at. To be where God is not at. You see, he sits the presence of God. He's gone. He's gone. He's nowhere around. And, that, and I'll tell you, people in hell right now are in agony and flames and fire and burning. And yet, no, God's nowhere around. And there is that. God created man and gave him an insatisfable desire for him. But you've got to receive him as your Lord and Savior. It's a choice you make. And God is gone. My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? God will not forsake you on this earth that as soon as you die, lost. Now Marvin's a good friend of mine. I have to preach a priest's funeral Wednesday. So I've known Marvin for a long time. But Marvin was prepared to meet God. So Marvin was ready. This is a violent society, right? In 1994, 95, I think it was. I received... One of my deacons at church received a phone call. He said, you need to be at the hospital. So we go to the hospital. And there lay his daughter, probably in her 20s. Dead. Had a boyfriend. This is a dark, this is a dark age. That was way back on a few years ago. It's way worse now than it was then. Darkness prevails. Evil is everywhere. And I looked, and there she was, laying there, and she was dead. And I stood there with my deacon as she looked at his daughter, and her boyfriend caught. They had separated. They had broke up. I mean, they both, I'm talking about Christian, a Christian young lady and a Christian man. He, he was a parole officer. And, um, in fact, when he came to my church, his mom and dad wouldn't let him come to church, so they come and heard me preach. So I, I don't want you to go just any any church. I mean, they're good Christian men. You see, you can be a good Christian and be caught up in the darkness of sin. Christian boy, young man, and a Christian young lady. But they broke up. So the mom and dad came to hear me preach and said, hey, you can go hear him. He preaches the word. You, you can go. And there would be times that he would sit on the bench and listen to me preach, him and his girlfriend. And then they separated. And one day he comes by and he catches her, her with another boyfriend and he shoots her and kills her. Shoots the boy for and, and and didn't kill him, but lamed, you know, just about made him a par paraplegic, and shoots and seals himself. And anyway, and I collected that from funeral. I, I have, 
It was a funeral. And I said these words. I said, this young lady became a victim of this violent society. She was a victim of this violent society. And they were about 93, 94, 95, somewhere around there. The newspaper reporter was there. And she wanted to hear what was being said. And that's what I said. And I meant it. But I don't think she liked it too well. Didn't matter to me whether she liked it or not. It was the truth. Anyway, she gave credit to the other preacher instead of me. I said it. But she said the other preacher said it. She, I'd hate to see her write a story, wouldn't you, if she got that mixed up. This is a violent society. Darkness is prevailing all around us. It is everywhere. The number three represents divine completeness. I love numerology in scriptures, and you can find divine completeness and perfection. That's what three means. Now, I'm going to go a little further here. I've got two more scriptures I'm going to give you here on this. So you've got divine completion. Jesus did that. Perfection. Jesus was perfect. Three hours of darkness, three o'clock in the afternoon. How long was he in the grave? Did you ever see that? Three hours of darkness, three o'clock, three days later, light. Ooh, amen. Light overpowers darkness. Amen. The only reason, you know, I was up very early this morning, of course, it was dark. And I said, you know, this earth has tilted 23 degrees, and when you turn away from the sun, you got darkness, right? Darkness cannot overcome light. Light can overcome darkness. It's a turning away from the sun. The reason we have night is we turn away from the sun. The reason we got evil, we've turned away from God. The reason we're living in a dark, evil society is America's keep God outside. We don't want God in nothing. We can't even mention God no more. That's where we're at right now, ladies and gentlemen. Am I telling the truth? We have turned away from God. And brother... Uh, you know, uh, Donnie was talking about it. Christians have been persecuted and shot and killed and beheaded all over this world. And even in America, these are dark days. But it don't seem to bother a lot of people. It don't seem to bother a lot of preachers. It don't seem to bother a lot of Christians. These are dark, dark days that we live in. Now, so, three days later, light sprang up. And Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, 23, two great verses of Scripture. The light of the body. The revelation of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, eye, which means, again, your mind. Here, it's, it's your mind, really. When you say the eye, it's rip, it represents the eye symbolically, metaphorically. It means your mind said, your eye, if therefore your eye be single. Single means one, right? If you focus on one, that's one. That ain't two or three or four. You know, we, we are monotheistic religious. We, we worship one God. We're monotheistic. We worship one God. I, 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 my mind is focused on one God, and, and, and that God is Jehovah. If my eye, if my thinking be on one God, and it is, and you shall have no other gods before you. So if my thinking's on God, if I'm focused on God, and, and that's what it says here, then my whole body will be full of what? Light. I focus upon God. I, I give my attention upon God. And I think about God, uh, one God. Then my body will be full of light. And if that light is in there, then that light should come out of me and spread light in the midst of a dark and generation that we live in. All of us should be shining wherever we're at. No matter where we're at. No matter how sinful it is, we should be shining or let God shine through us as light. Amen? Amen. That's what we should be. See, if my, if, are you focusing upon God? Is God the center of your 
attraction. Is God the center of your life? Is He the center of your life? Is He before everybody else? You've got to put God first. Have no other gods before me. It's not your house, not your car, not your money. It's not this, it's not that. God should be number one in our lives. Yeah. But then he goes on and gets another verse here. But, but in contrast to verse 22, look at the opposite. But if thine eye be evil, if my thinking, if I focus upon this or focus upon that, some secular things, evil, and spend all my time on secular things, then my whole body shall be full of darkness. Right? Amen. No light there. Darkness. You wouldn't think that that young boy that professed to be a Christian and was, as far as I know, could take a gun and kill his girlfriend and kill and shoot another guy and then shoot himself. We have the potentiality as a Christian to do bad things. And let me tell you, the devil will make havoc with you if you get away from your Bible study, you get away from church attendance, and you get away from God in your prayer life. The devil will get you. Amen. I mean, you easy pray. I have to constantly stay in Bible study. I have to constantly stay in prayer and committed to God and to his ministry. If I don't, then I become easy prey to the devil. And I'm telling you, a lot of Christians are there. we got Christian people that are getting used to the dark. And they compromise with everything. Oh, that's not so bad. That's not so bad, you know. Sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. If therefore the light. Now listen, this is really interesting. I, I had never really seen this before. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. How can light be darkness? If the light that's in thee, he's talking about a person. If the light that is in thee be darkness, then he asks the question, how great is that darkness? Hmm. You mean there's light in every person? Oh, yeah, I've got two scriptures I want to show you. You say, you mean to tell me that, that, that God... Puts light in every person. Light is revelation. Okay. Look at this verse. That was the true light, and that's genuine light. That light is Christ, right? That was that true light. But get this which lighteth, which lighteth every man, every person. That cometh into the world that's born. Every little baby out there that's being born right now. And they're under God's protection. I understand that. But when they come to the age of accountability, if you're a boy or a girl here today and you've come to the age of accountability, there is light within you. And that light tells you that you're lost, you need to be saved, and that's the time you need to be saved when you understand that God reveals that to you. God puts light in every person light. However, how does light become darkness? When you turn away from the Son of God, then darkness prevails. When you say no to God, no God, I will not. I will not accept you. Then you turn away. That light was in you becomes dark. And then the revelation that you had of being saved is gone. And then how great is that darkness? It's so great that you'll probably die without being saved. You'll die and go to eternal hell forever. Amen. That's how great that darkness is. But Now, but that light in there, that light that's inside of every human being, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman, if the light is in there, you better take advantage of it. Now I want to show you another verse. This is, this is Romans 1.19. Because that which may be known of God, he says, is manifest, is revealed. Now this is to unsaved people. When you read the preceding verse, when you go to verse 18, and I didn't put it on there, but you can read it in Romans 1.18. It talks about unbelieving people and said, The light that is in thee, may be, because that which may be known of God, I'm sorry, is manifested, revealed in them. That's where God reveals the light, inside your spirit. He reveals it in there. He reveals himself inside. For God has showed it unto them. It's not me. It's not me. 
You know what I'm trying to do today? I know my responsibility as a pastor and as a, as a, as a, as a, a preacher. It is my responsibility to get the light to your mind. It is my responsibility to preach this gospel. Don't hide this gospel. Preach the truth. And my, my responsibility is get the message to your mind. i got to get it to your mind. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to hit it hard. I want to say, I want to bring this gospel to your mind. I'm going to tell you the truth. I've got to get it to your mind. Who's going to get it from your mind to your heart? Not me. I can't. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to get it to your mind. And I'm going to do that. But it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to get it from your mind to your heart. And that's what we got to have. I'll get it to your mind. I know my responsibility and I'll do it. I'm going to look at these two verses and I'm going to pick up some verses in conclusion. The saint's treasure. For we preach not ourselves but Christ, he said. Jesus the Lord. We're not preaching about ourselves. We're not struck on ourselves. I've seen a few preachers that struck on themselves, talking about themselves, what they've done. They've got too many eyes in it. I this, I that. It's not what they do. It's what we're supposed to preach about Jesus. We're supposed to exalt Jesus. That's the whole thing about it, Paul says. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light, or who spoke the light, to shine out of darkness, and it did. And, uh, I mean, it's just like he said, let there be light and the sun come up. And therefore, he told Jesus to go down in the dark world, in the midst of a dark world. He was that true light, and he lighteth every man that comes into the world. Shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's done that. Now, but we have this treasure, this revelation. That's revelation when you look at verse number 6. That is revelation. We have divine revelation. God reveals himself to us in our spirits. And he says, we have this treasure. So light is a treasure. It's in an earthen vessel. It's in a human body. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Divine revelation. And, and it was said so well, which means communicating knowledge to humans by God. It's something God does, not me. God communicates the knowledge to you. God puts light in there. I can't do that. I can only give you the gospel. Matthew 16, 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my Father which is in heaven. That's God's responsibility. God has to reveal himself to you. God had to reveal himself to me. And now I'm preaching the gospel to you to tell you that we are living in darkness and the blindness of Satan. He's bl if you're here and you're not saved, he's blinded you and I. I got hope for you. You can have light. You can be cured. You can be healed. And Jesus can do it. Amen. He can do it. I can't. If I could save, if I had a wand, I'd go through every one of them and top you on top of the head and say, you're saved. I can't do that. But Jesus can. He can save you. What happened here? I guess some more scripture. I don't know what happened. Anyway. And uh, sometimes technology don't always work. See if you get to the last one, Mark. Next one. Next one, I think, is it. Something happened here. See what the next one is. That's it. That's what I want. 
2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel be hid, I'm going to go back to this repetition, if our gospel be hid, stay to them that are lost. Now, John 16, 8 through 11, I want you to listen to what the Holy Spirit's work is, his ministry, and we're going to, we're going to give an invitation. And when he has come, and by the way, he's already come, that's Holy Spirit, he will reprove, convict, the word prove, reprove means to convict, convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then he says in verse number 9, he convicts the world of sin. Here's the sin. It's not these acts that people do that sends them to hell. The, the sin that he convicts you of because you believe not on him. You say, well, I believe on God in my head. Well, you've got to move it from your head to your heart. You can't, you can't go to heaven just believing in God. You can't go to heaven just believing in Jesus. You have to ask him to come into your heart and save you. You have to be born again because you've got to really believe on it. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you shall see me no more. He was the Son of God. He wasn't just a good prophet. He wasn't just a, that. He was the Son of God. You've got to believe that. You've got to believe all that. And then you've got to believe that judgment because the prince of this world is judged. That's Satan. He judged him on the cross, three hours of darkness, and then the third day he arose. Stayed on the earth 40 days and 40 nights and went back to be with God. And there's light today. Now, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I don't know. I know what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to believe Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like for you to say, hey, Jesus, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I've got it to your mind. Now it's up to God to get it in your heart. It's up to the Holy Spirit to get in your heart. I hope he does. Stand with me for prayer. Father, I delivered my soul. And I pray, Lord, this morning, there's somebody here that needs this message. You don't give a preacher a message for, unless it's for someone. You gave me this message for someone. How we've got used to the dark. We're God living in a dark time. And Lord, we've got people that uh, are lost without hope. Boy, they need to see some light. They need to see some light in my my life. I hope that I can br shine bright. I, I hope I have. I I've preached for it. I didn't hide the gospel this morning, Jesus. I didn't hide it. I brought it to their attention. Now, Holy Spirit, I want you to do a work here. I want you to do something special here. And some boy, some girl, some man, some woman, I want you to do something this morning. I really do. I want you to really move in somebody's heart to give them the opportunity to come to know you and meet you as the dearest friend in their life. I want to do that. While heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed, here's what God told me to do. Brother Sonny, I want you to come to the altar. I want you to pray for all these front row preach people here. Pray for the Holy Spirit to bring light into their soul and pray for the whole conviction of the Holy Spirit and assurance of salvation. Bobby Revis, would you come to the altar, please? Brother Bobby, I want you to pray for all those people on both sides in the middle. I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit to go through each pew and stop at every heart door and pray for God to bring conviction or assurance of salvation. Brother Dennis Hudskins, would you come here, please, to the altar? I got three deacons here that we're praying for this whole congregation. And if you're here today, Dennis is going to pray for all you in the back back there for salvation, for rededication, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. These men are going to pray while we sing. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, He's put light into your soul. I have confronted you with the gospel of Christ. You're going to have to make decisions. Make the right ones. If God is dealing with you right now, you come down this aisle.
We got men here. These men are praying for the Holy Spirit to bring light into your soul. Don't leave here in darkness. Don't leave here in darkness. Somebody will come with you. If you say, I don't want to go by myself. Somebody will come with you. Just tell somebody to come on with you. You need to come and let Jesus save you this morning. Let Jesus come into your heart. And you'll leave here rejoicing. I'm going to turn it over to the Holy Spirit right now. Brother Earl, while these brothers are praying, would you sing? 161. 161. Jesus is tenderly calling the heart. Calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam? Father and father away. Calling today, calling today.
will not turn thee away. Ain't amazing God sent her up here from, from Mississippi, and she gave her heart to the Lord. And Jeff and Amber. Stacy. 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 I'll get it right in a minute. I didn't know the name Stacy. So we're grateful for what God can do in the heart of a young person. I knew somebody going to get saved. I just knew it. And uh, so I didn't know it would be. Amber didn't know who it would be. But let me tell you, if you leave here today, you leave with confrontation in your mind. I confronted you with the gospel. And the Holy Spirit is trying to confront you in your heart. I, I hope you have many, many, many more chances to get saved. I hope you do. Just don't keep turning it away. So God bless you. Okay. I want you uh, to just come around and shake hands with Stacy and Amber and Jeff, okay? And this will be our benediction. So you guys just come around, okay? Thank you, brethren. For praying. So let's just come around. This will be the benediction. See you tonight, 6 o'clock. Bless you, Jeff. Good to have you. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Well, I got so excited about her getting saved. They want to join our church. They want First Baptist Church of uh, McGee, Mississippi. What, McGee. McGee, Mississippi. McGee, Mississippi. Okay. Doris from First, they're joining by letter from McGee. First Baptist Church, McGee, Mississippi. Okay. Praise the Lord for that. And I'll baptize uh, Amber. We've got some more to baptize. Now, here's what I plan on doing now. And I hope we have another. Now, we've got one, two, two, already maybe some more. Uh, what's the name of that place over on 411 Highway? Franklin, there's a pavilion there. Okay, what I want to do, you don't mind being baptized in the river, do you? Don't matter? Okay, I usually do it right back there. But I love to do it in the river, too. So what I want to do is we're going to have, uh, before it gets cold, before it gets cold, probably September. Hopefully, in two or three weeks, we'll, if we can get another two or three saved, we'll just take them down there. We're going to go down there. We're going to have Sunday night church down there, and uh, then we'll have a baptism. I'll baptize them in the river. And uh, where's uh, Amy's going to get baptized? Uh, so Amy's going to join. And then that's three already. And so hopefully some more. And we're going to go down there. We're going to have a dinner on. It ain't going to be on the ground. It'll be on the table. And we'll have a good time. Uh, we'll baptize them there. And we'll just have a good night together. Amen. Amen. Uh, you pray for that, that it'll be, hopefully. Well, we got three, so we're going to go anyway. So I'll just set the date, okay? We'll just set the date. So what's the pledge of the church? We receive them by letter. Okay. Got a second? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Praise the Lord. That's good. Okay. Come around and shake hands with them. Get to know them, okay? God bless you, gal. You'll be in my prayer.